Well, greetings everyone, and on today's episode, we're going to rank all seven of the Roger Moore James Bond films, and that's starting right now. Before we get into the actual ranking, I've just got a couple of things I want to say first. Uh, first off, just want to get this out of the way. If you haven't already subscribed, why don't you give us a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. It'll really help us to build the channel, build the James Bond community, and have better discussions and chats with everyone. So if you can do that, I really, really would appreciate it. And before we get into my actual ranking of the Roger Moore James Bond films, I just want to say... Even though obviously one is, you know, the number one slot and one is the number seven slot, I don't actually don't like any of the Roger Moore Bond films. In fact, I think they're all absolutely fantastic. I love how they're all so unique and different and Roger plays Bond a bit differently in every film, which I really appreciate. It's just, I think within anyone's tenure, there are some I prefer a bit more than others. I think that's fair to say. And I've really spent a lot of time going through the list or re-watching a couple again to really make sure I'm happy where I've put things in my ranking. I think some of them might be a bit surprising to you all. Some of them might be very obvious what I put as like number one or two or number seven. You know, it, it's up to everyone's interpretation here. But I have the right to change my opinion, I feel, as time goes on. But right now, I feel very confident in my ranking of Roger Moore James Bond films. And i just like to say right now, before we go into the actual list, if you haven't watched the Roger Moore James Bond films, I think go definitely and watch them because they're all great in their own certain way, just some, in my opinion, are more great than others. So with that being said, I've just put that little you know, asterisk at the beginning of this video, explaining you know, how I feel about them all. I think it's time we get started. So let's go into my number seven. I'll be honest, number seven and number six really sort of hopscotched between each other a bit. But again, I'm happy where I put this. And I do think this is the, probably um, the worst one if I had to compare them all to each other. But my number seven slot does go to A View to a Kill. As I mentioned previous, I do love A View to a Kill. I really like it. I think there's some great things in it. Example being, I love Christopher Walken as Max Zorin. I love the, if you will, modernization golfing a plot with microchips. I think that's really, really great. I love the finale on the Golden Gate Bridge. That, I think, is also fantastic. But there has to be a reason why I feel View to a Kill is at the bottom of this. And I think it goes down to, I think, really these two main things that every time I watch them, even though I enjoy it, it they always do just pull me out of the movie. And the first one, obviously, is Roger Moore's Age. Now, again, I said, Roger Moore is brilliant. He's fantastic, but my God, he does look a lot older in this film than he did in Octopussy. Octopussy was still at the level I feel I could just believe him as James Bond, but here, do you know what? I've made this joke many times, but I've got to say it again here. I feel like Sylvester Stallone wasn't the first expendable. I think actually Roger Moore was in this film. It just, every time I see him do some sort of action scenes or whenever you, you're meant to believe it's actually him doing it, it just pulls me out of the movie every time because I just can't help but end up laughing a little bit at this film whenever I see it happen. And just how everyone, some people have just been aged up, just makes it look a bit even more ridiculous, really. And I just feel like he's running a bit on sort of, you know, automatic. I think everyone's just feeling a bit tired and everyone's just starting to show their age in this film this film and it just does pull me out a bit of the time and I think the second thing is is even though I said I loved some of the action sequences in this film and I like Christopher Walken very much in this film the other supporting cast members for me aren't just really working as good as other people you know Tanya Roberts as the main Bond girl again I've seen her in other things she's actually quite a good actress I've seen her things but here it's just James James and it does get so annoying and you know i'm not the biggest fan of grace jones though i do think she does belong in the line of some of the best henchmen in the series and again outside of you know the battle at golden gate bridge most of the action in this film just feels really sort of cartoony over the top like the bit in the fire engine just felt this is just no this is something about it it's just old man dangling off a fire engine just isn't really saying to me james bond and, you know, the bits with the horses I don't think is that particularly great. 
Um, the bit in the mine is all right, I suppose. And I think the pre-tile sequence is almost ruined a bit by the uh, cover of the Beach Boys song. So, yeah, you know, I still think View to a Kill is quite an enjoyable film. I really much do enjoy the film. I do like to watch it every now and then. So let that be said. But of all the Roger Moore James Bond films, yeah, this one for me probably is the weakest. All right, moving on to number six, as I said, when I was coming up with this list, number six and seven really sort of hopscotch between each other. But again, I do think my number six one, I think the film that's slightly better than A View to a Kill is The Man with the Golden Gun. Now, Man with the Golden Gun has, I think, some of the best things actually in the Bond franchise. You've got Scaramanga's Funhouse. You've got Sir Christopher Lee as, I think, one of the best Bond villains of all time in Francisco Scaramanga. You've got an amazing sort of supporting cast with Maud Adams and an annoyingly underused Britt Eklund, but still Britt Eklund is in the film. You've got some cool kung fu stuff, which I'm a fan of kung fu, so I really, really do like that film uh, stuff. Uh, but outside of that, there is more enjoyment here, I find, than A View to a Kill. But there is some stuff that really is annoying in this film. I think Roger Moore's portrayal of James Bond is just not right here. I know everyone says that, but I really do strongly believe that. I like seeing that slightly darker edge to the Roger Moore Bond, but it's not the right sort of darker edge like we got later on in the series with For Your Eyes Only. So that, I think, really is a bit annoying as well. Um, outside of that, you've also got that, you know, car chase in it, which is okay, but that amazing stunt that we all know is ruined by that whistle. Yeah, that is just really, really annoying. I do like Sheriff J.W. Pepper in this, in this film, and I do like him in Live and Let Die. So, you know, that's a positive, but for me, even though I would put this above a view to a kill, and I stand by it, the man with the golden gun probably would be the Roger Moore film I watched the least. Um, the only reason I think I do come back to it as much is I want to watch the clips with Bond versus Scaramanga. See, that really is the crux of my issue with the film. I think the whole part of the Solex agitator is completely pointless and not really an interesting MacGuffin for the film. I'd much rather that this film was basically Bond versus Scaramanga and the whole world is their battleground. And the bits of the film that are more of like that, I think are just firing on Ace of Cylinders. You know, every time Bond and Scaramanga, the whole finale of this film at Scaramanga's Island, to me, is the best part of the movie and I love it so much to bit. So, yeah, at uh, number six, it is just marginally beating number seven, The Man with the Golden Gun. All right, at number five, and Calvin Dyson will say, shame on you for this. No, wait, really. But um, at number five is probably Moonraker. Now, don't get me wrong here. I love Moonraker. I love it. Bond in space, laser gun battles, my two of my favorite things in the world, Star Wars beats James Bond coming together, and I do unabashedly love this film. And there are half things I really love about it. I mean, Jaws is a bit more of a comic thing here but again the battles between him are great the pre-title sequence in this film is absolutely amazing uh you know the whole uh, fight on top of the cable car is fantastic and again the finale i've mentioned you know many times is great michael lonsdale as drax is superb but i think everything else in the film for me this is a perfect example with enough more than like die another day of Bond just losing touch and just going so over the top, you know, the double taking pigeon, and I think the whole flippancy of the film. I mean, I can't deny Moonraker is an incredibly fun movie. There's no denying that whatsoever. And I think it's one of the reasons why I do enjoy it as much. But I would like a certain level of um, I wouldn't say down to earth grittiness, but a bit of a bit of fair similitude, as they say, a bit of realism here, and I think Moonraker is, if you will, the cartoon James Bond film, and it's for that reason I really enjoy it, and I rank it as highly as I do at number five on this list. But for me, there were just—I wish there was just a bit more realism to it, a bit more of that, just to give it that little bit extra sort of zing to it. But I can't deny I enjoy the film for what it is. As I say, just go with the flow of Moonraker, have a bit of fun with it, and as. As Bond is trying to do, as always, he is 
she's attempting re-entry. Now at number four, and this film I have to say, if I'd done this list, sorry, say two years ago, you'd find this sort of film maybe down at number six. But a film that's really gone up and grown in my appreciation over the years is actually Octopussy. As a kid, I sort of just enjoyed Octopussy. It was very vanilla in my opinion. It was just, yeah, it was just the Bond film in India. There wasn't really much else about it I loved. But over the years, I've watched Octopussy again and again and again and just realized actually, what a fantastic Cold War thriller masterpiece in a way it actually is. You know, yes, there's these, you know, like, you know, the jungles, you know, Tarzan, Yelp, and there's the whole, you know, sit, you know, and stuff. And there is a bit of, you know, lunacy to there. But it's the right amount that goes with the Roger Moore style, which we've all sort of, if you're a fan of Roger Moore, just love. I do love, I think, this film has that perfect balance of that camp over the topness with the serious Cold War thrillers I mentioned there. And you know, the more I watch Octopussy, each time I watch it over the years, the more and more I appreciate it, and the more and more I love it. I think um, Louis Jordan's, you know, uh, Kamal Khan was a great Apache villain. Mordan's here did even better than she did Mamagon Gun here as Octopussy. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try and butcher the names, but the actor for Gabinda was, I think, very, very iconic to me as a kid, and right up there with, like, Jaws. I love the locations here, I have to say, when it comes to um, India. It looks fantastic. And again, the whole sort of action pieces in this film, like the pre-title sequence, the, you know, after the pre-title sequence, you know, they're chasing the two brothers, you know, for the double O agent, which is terrific. The train sequence, oh my God. You know, again, I've always said, when Bond's on a train, magic always happens. And I truly didn't appreciate this film for what it was doing, that whole action sequence when I was a kid. And again, ending on the fight on, a, you know, on a plane at the end as well, in the raid, on um, Kamal Khan's palace, everything here I think fires more cylinders, and the dialogue is so snappy, so brilliant, and I love how this film, I know it sounds silly, but I don't always like it when Bond goes against his villains just by fisticuffs, Fleming always used like the card table or game of golf or something for Bond to do battle with his villains, and here again you've got it in the backgammon scene, terrifically done here and so well paced, so yeah, you know what, Octopussy really has grown on me so much and maybe in a couple of years time it might even get higher on this list and I think out of all the Roger Moore films and of all the ones I'm going to say here Octopussy is the one you really should just go and reevaluate because I have so much and there's so much more stuff I could talk about it here but I don't want to go on and on and on about it but yeah definitely go watch Octopussy. So, now we are entering the top three of the Roger Moore James Bond films, and starting off the top three is a film I've always loved as a kid, didn't really understand why as much, um, but as an adult I love it even more, and that has been Four Eyes Only. I, I, I can't tell you, but I've always loved Four Eyes Only, and I don't know what it is about it, but I've come to this idea about why I think it is such a great film, and it's nothing to do with the fact that after Moonraker we went more down to earth, and stuff like that. It was nothing to do with that. But I actually think in Four Eyes Only, Roger Moore gives his best performance as James Bond. I think that's one of the big contributing factors. He plays both his version of it and more of the Fleming version. I mean, the whole bit where he has, you know, the dove, you know, lock on the um, side of the cliff and he kicks it over that lovely bit of, you know, you left this with Ferrari. That was such a quintessential Fleming S past the character, but Roger Moore did it so fantastically. This is definitely, I doubt, I think, his best portrayal as James Bond. And I think one of the other great underrated bits about Four Eyes Only is actually the sort of side secondary plot with Melina Havelock. This whole revenge story just really adds to the whole film and gives it a brand new dimension. And I think it's so good that you could take just this revenge plot line itself and actually turn it into its own movie but it's when it's tangled in with James Bond's story as well and so effortlessly done it just makes the whole experience of this film such a more rounded package. The action sequences are really great the um, you know the whole plot is really really great you know I love they've also taken other things out of Fleming's novel such as you know from Limit Die obviously Bond being you know 
obviously in the water and the sharks around him and key hauling sequence that's it that you know that's really great as well the rock climbing sequence still as a kid had me on like tender hooks literally leaning forward saying oh crap you know if you fell off here that i thought that scene was better than any sort of like gadget ridden sort of chase sequence you could ever give me and i still stand by it to this day I've just always liked Four Eyes Only. I think it's just a really great film. It has a great pace. It's a real character-driven story in the James Bond franchise. And I think it proves, actually, despite what people think it's about, like, maybe the gadgets and the fast cars and the women and stuff, what makes a great Bond film is in this film, which it's about the Cold War spy thriller-esque story and great characters to support it. And... So yeah, for, I think for those reasons, I just really stand by it. I think Friday's Only is a great James Bond film. And I've always liked it as a kid. I think I like it even more as an adult. And yeah, I'd give this one another recommendation to watch. So yeah, Friday's Only gets into uh, number three slot. All right, so now we're going into the number two slot. And you, I'm sure you all know what the two Roger Moore films that are left. And you've probably already guessed which one is my number two and which one's my number one. To be honest, you're right, and we'll get into that. So, as you've already guessed, probably my number two one is Live and Let Die. I have always loved Live and Let Die. I loved how unique it is in the Bond franchise, its feel, the storyline about it, the characters, everything about this, from the moment I saw it for the first time, I absolutely adored it. And actually, I think this is one of my older brother's favorite James Bond films as well, and I can't really blame him for it. There is so much in this film that is, I think, absolutely brilliant, and certainly coming after Diamonds Are Forever. For me, a much better return to what makes a great James Bond film. The locations are great, you know, you've got the crocodile farm, which I think is iconic, that boat sequence is terrific, Chef J.W. Pepper, you've got great characters like Kananga and Solitaire, which are fantastic, Teehee, I think one of the best Bond henchmen of all time, and do you know what? Still to this day, I just love going, hey, <laughs> Hey, you know, again, that fight scene with him and Bond at, just at the end is the little uh, add-on bit was terrific as well. I don't know what it is about um, Live and Let Die that I think really ranks it so highly. Because I know it's like well regarded in the franchise, but for me, it is quite high up in my overall ranking. And I think it's just because it has its own unique identity and style to it. I love Roger Moore in his like opening James Bond film here. I think he gives a really great performance, really setting himself away from Sean being James Bond but not being a Sean Connery imitator here and it's just a really great story a great fun ride and I think it's one of those films that's a bit more low-key it's not like big world destruction in the world things but even within that context the stakes always feel really high and really sort of connected to what's going on here so I think that's a really good important thing as well so yeah uh, again I could go on about this for a long time live and let die but I'm going to decide to stop there before I go even further on it. But I do think Live and Let Die is one of the best Bond films. So that really does just move us into number one. And I think we all know what one I haven't said yet. And I think it's the favourite of most other people. Heck, it was Roger Moore's favourite film he did, The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, The Spy Who Loved Me, Roger Moore's favourite as well. And I can understand why, because I think this is one of the... Those sort of films, if you're just a fan of action films and spy films you should see Spy Who Loved Me. If you're someone who doesn't really know the franchise and wants a film to sort of get started in it and wants something a bit more easier, a bit more lighthearted to get into, you watch The Spy Who Loved Me. The Spy Who Loved Me, I think, is just one of those great Bond films that come around every now and then. You know, I'm talking about the Goldfingers and the Casino Royale, the Skyfalls, the, you know, those sort of ones. It's really up there, I think, with some of the greats. And... There's so many reasons why I think it is, and I, I put it down to mostly these three reasons. Number one, I think they got Roger Moore's Bond nailed down, this one of what style he is and going forward, how he's going to be. And they tow their outline of that over the top sort of don't take it too seriously. You must laugh with it, not at it. But at the same time, really give him still some like, this is a spy genre and this is a spy thriller. We're still going to give you that. And it perfectly, I think, balances out here in this film better than any of the others so i think that's one of the reasons definitely why it is i think the second reason is weird enough i think the 
sort of like locations and action sequences are really really great they don't go on too long they're all relevant to the story and the plot and they progress the story forward which i think in these sort of films you do need that very much so one of the issues i have with modern day stuff is sometimes it just doesn't do that but spy love me does it incredibly well you know it has its own identity its own uniqueness the spy who loved me which i think is super super important and i think the third reason why I feel it is the best Roger Moore film is because this film just feels like it's taken everything that the last nine Bond films have done and sort of refined it, sort of rejigged it and really made it like we've learned from those nine films, this is what makes a great James Bond thriller and they sort of just show it all within this film. I, I really do to this day go back to saying look if you want to do a big over-the-top bombastic spy James Bond thriller, look at Spy Who Loved Me. It does it absolutely spot on with everything. I think the future Bond films that have done so well do take a bit of credit from the Spy Who Loved Me on how it approaches things. So that's, I think, the three big reasons why, for me, the Spy Who Loved Me is Roger Moore's best James Bond film. And I really want to know, everyone, what are your thoughts on my list? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? I really want to know. Comment down below and tell me your thoughts about the Roger Moore James Bond films. What's your favourite? I really, really want to know. Super excited to hear your thoughts. So yeah, everyone, that is the end of today's episode. That's my ranking of all Roger Moore James Bond films. As always, everyone, take care. Goodbye.